Okay, well, I think we are, we're going to start. Uh, my name is, um, is Mats Berdalm and I'm a professor in the Department of War Studies. And I'm also a director of the Conflict Security and Development Group. And it's a very, very great pleasure to welcome Ian Martin here uh, this afternoon. Ian Martin has been with the group as a senior research fellow since 2018. But many of you will know Ian Martin from a long and distinguished career as a UN senior UN official, uh, heading several UN human rights and peace operations, including in Rwanda, Timor-Leste, Nepal, and of course in Libya. Indeed, in Libya in 2011 and 2012, he was uh, Ban Ki-moon's or the Secretary General's post-conflict advisor, and then of course the UN support mission head. Now, he's here because he has spent part of COVID very sensibly writing up uh, his experience, reflecting on his experience uh, in Libya and around the planning for the Libya operation. And the book, which is available, I should say, at the back for a much reduced price and more importantly, is, is very well worth reading and spending some time on revisits the international uh, engagement in Libya from February 2011 through to the uprising in July, sorry, through the, through the first election uh, in July 2012. Now, with all that is going on around us at the moment, uh, those events may seem uh, to some of you a long time ago, but as I think the book certainly makes clear, a more nuanced understanding of that intervention, what prompted it, how it unfolded, and why it was eventually followed by a descent into renewed civil war, is deeply relevant to an understanding not only of where we are today in Libya and in the wider region, but also to broader developments in international politics over the past decade. And of course, to more specific issues, such as the dilemmas and risks raised by military involvement in defense of human rights, and of course, the UN's role in such operations. Now, I said a more nuanced understanding because that is precisely what we have uh, received and got here. And I say again that this is an issue, this is an intervention which generated a lot of, of debate and heat and discourse, and much of it inaccurate or ill-informed or representing particular views. So I think this was much overdue that we got this particular perspective. Now, what uh, we're going to do is we're gonna start off with a bit of a conversation. I'm gonna ask some questions and then 20, 25 minutes into that, I'll open up for broader questions from, from the, the audience. And then we'll have a bit of time afterwards for those who want to, to buy the book. And I'll do my level best to juggle the online presence and questions there and from the audience. Uh, and Ian, I think, I'm going to start where you start in the way in the book as well, right at the beginning, where you ask the question whether the international intervention in Libya, whether it was a justified response to an impending massacre and a wider threat to civilians, or whether there were other motivations involved in seeking to oust Gaddafi and to shape the future of what was an oil-rich country. Uh, some will already have an answer to that. People will have lined up on the different sides of the aisle. But I think your perspective on the on the justifications for the intervention will be a very good point to start. And I'll just wait till everyone is no, that's, no worries. This always happens with it coming through downstairs. I know. I apologise for going through this. Already. But Ian, do you want to start there on the sure justification for the sure. intervention? First, Max. Many thanks to you and to KCL for hosting this. Um, I'm also very pleased to meet my publisher for the first time, Michael Dwyer, who I've had a lot of online communication with, but it's the first time we're, uh, we're meeting in, in person. Um, yes, I do think the intervention was initially justified. Um, I thought so at the time. I'm not a gung ho interventionist. Um, I mentioned in the introduction that uh, my views about previous interventions are quite mixed. Uh, I worked in Rwanda quite soon after the genocide and saw the consequences of non intervention. Uh, I was in East Timor uh, heading the mission that conducted the self determination referendum there that was then engulfed in the violence that followed uh, and welcomed and indeed encouraged. Uh, 
military intervention led by Australia, authorized by the UN Security Council. Uh, but I was so opposed to uh, the illegal invasion of Iraq uh, that uh, I resigned 38 years membership of the Labour Party when Tony Blair uh, uh, supported George Bush in that gratuitous invasion. So I think that interventions and indeed non-interventions need to be considered, each of them in their, their own context. Uh, when military intervention was authorized and began in Libya, I had no personal involvement. Indeed, I had no inkling that I was going to become involved. I was only looking at it uh, like, uh, I guess, almost everybody here was, except for Libyans, who had very different reasons to look closely at it. Um, uh, but it did seem to me then that it was justified, and I, in writing and preparing to write this book, uh, I've looked more closely than I ever had at the information, the human rights information from uh, organizations like Amnesty International, Human Rights Watch, the Human Rights Council Commission of the Investigation, um, uh, first-hand accounts from journalists who were on the ground, Alex Crawford of Sky News, who was in Al Zawiya when that was brutally retaken by Gaddafi's forces. Um, uh, and so I, I do believe uh, that, uh, unfortunately, Gaddafi had failed to respond to a wave of condemnation of the repression of the uprising uh, from everybody, the United Nations, African Union, League of Arab States, uh, governments all around the world, organization of Islamic cooperation and, and so on. Uh, to a first Security Council resolution that had sort of thrown almost every tool in the Security Council's toolbox, short of military intervention uh, uh, at Libya, uh, sanctions, arms embargo, referral to the National Criminal Court. Uh, and yet none of that led to uh, any uh, reining back of Gaddafi's forces. Uh, in seeking to retake cities that had uh, gone into rebel hands. It's true, of course, that the uprising, because of how quickly it was brutally repressed, had itself taken up arms uh, quite quickly too. And it's therefore hard to distinguish between unarmed civilians who were being killed and, and those who had taken up arms. Um, so uh, I think there was a case for humanitarian intervention. And you asked the question, or were there other motives? Uh, and of course, uh, those who, whenever one looks at an oil-rich country, uh, think that a motive may very well have been uh, uh, related to its, its riches. Um, I don't believe that's the case. I, I haven't found any uh, indication in terms of uh, uh, what one knows about the considerations amongst the decision makers, um, that that was a motive. Uh, of course, before long, uh, countries, especially those that intervened, were looking to their future trading relations, arms sales relations with a rich uh, Libya. So, so naturally that, um, especially when the National Transitional Council suggested that uh, those who supported the intervention would be or intervened would might be, be favored in close conflict contracts and so on. Uh, but I do believe it was a in, in its initial motive uh, a humanitarian intervention. Um, uh, and I don't believe either that it was initially uh, a regime change operation in the sense that Iraq was um, because uh, and that's why I get quite uh, irritated when Iraq and Libya and sometimes Afghanistan as well are all mentioned in the same breath as if they're very similar situations. Iraq was a completely gratuitous uh, invasion, um, mm. whereas Libya uh, was initially an internal uprising which then confronted external actors with how they were going to respond to it. And that's very different indeed. Um, and there's also a tendency now to forget the broader context of the so-called Arab Spring, the Arab uprisings, how quickly Ben Ali had gone in Tunisia, how quickly Mubarak had gone in Egypt. I think actually there, there was rather an expectation that Gaddafi simply would go quickly. You know, there were defections around him very soon. 
rather than uh, a planned regime change uh, that, that changed over time. And yet, uh, just on that, um, you also make the point, which I think is an interesting one, and I would tend to agree that I mean, at the time, a number of prominent um, advocates and supporters of the Responsibility Protect, um, which had sort of crystallized over the previous uh, five or six years since the General Assembly Resolution, saw this as the, finally, this is the application of the R2P. Uh, I think the evidence is, for that is, is, is rather more limited, and I think you reinforce that. If they look to anything, they look back to Srebrenica and Durandia in the early 90s, rather than to the recent evolution of the R2P doctrine. Yes, I mean, that, the way I look at it is that, um, I mean, there was indeed a, a great deal of talk about Rwanda, Srebrenica on steroids, and, and I should have said in referring to the evidence around the uprising, there was also a lot of exaggeration uh, in media reporting, in, in rhetoric, talk of genocide, uh, uh, inappropriate comparisons, in my opinion, to, to Rwanda and, and, and Srebrenica. Um, but there's no doubt uh, when one looks at the policymakers that the past experience of non-intervention in Rwanda and, and what happened in Srebrenica weighed very heavily on them. And that's uh, not just the, uh, the, the, the French and UK and American decision makers. Uh, I quote the, uh, the current prime minister of Norway, who was then the foreign minister, is, is talking about how uh, Rwanda and Srebrenica weighed on a whole generation of, uh, of, of, of politicians and, and shaped their response. What I don't see is anybody said, you know, okay, the General Assembly has adopted the responsibility to protect, so we have to assess it against this. And so I, there were some references in New York to, to R2P and some language that was resonant of, of R2P, but you don't find it, frankly, in the, in the considerations, so far as I can see, uh, of, the, uh, of, of the key decision makers. So, Definitely, but, but you know, these are two parallel things. I mean, R2P came out of, mm. there mustn't be another Rwanda in Srebrenica. Um, but I think the response of the policy makers to say you have to stop there being another Rwanda in Srebrenica would have been there even if the doctrine hadn't been formulated in the meantime. We come to the actual unfolding of the of the campaign itself um, and how NATO became eventually drawn into a civil war. And I think one of the, certainly for me, one of the most interesting <laughs> chapters in the book is, uh, and partly because it is deeply relevant uh, today, is, is whether or not, in your view, um, there ever was a real possibility of a peaceful transition, um, one that could have been brought about by UN mediation, or by the African Union or others. Indeed, as you point out, uh, other parties, the Norwegian government was quite actively involved behind the scenes as well. I'm just interested, I mean, the counter view is to say that, you know, there was very little to do with Gaddafi in power, but I, I wonder whether you could speak more to that chapter that deals with the possibilities of a, of a peaceful transition. I mean, I think there's no doubt that Gaddafi's obduracy was a huge obstacle to any possibility of a managed transition or a mediated outcome, and I think all the mediators came to that conclusion because at the end of the day, uh, the last issue that couldn't be resolved was, is Gaddafi going to step down? Is Gaddafi going to, going to take a leap? Um, uh, and people who were close to him, uh, Musa Kusa, his foreign minister, who defected, uh, you know, all testify to uh, his own lack of realism. And although there was some interest on the part of some of those around him, clearly, it was his son, Saif Islam Gaddafi, who, on whose behalf the Norwegians were contacted very early uh, and asked to become involved before military intervention had been, been authorised. And there was a Norwegian mediation team in Tripoli as the Security Council resolution for, uh, for, for military intervention was, was passed. Um, uh, and that's part of the story that hasn't been very much uh, written about outside um, mm -hmm. outside Norway. Um, but uh, I think to have had the maximum possibility of a managed transition would have required a coordinated effort by mm -hmm. the different external actors. Um, 
who had the most influence with Gaddafi himself, you know, probably the Africans, probably Jacob Zuma, who was the only person who twice face to face, uh, once on behalf of the African Union, once on his own, uh, you know, saw Gaddafi and told him the game was up and he should, uh, he should step down, although how strong he is is entirely clear. Um, but the Africans had the map, that, that access to, to Gaddafi. On the other hand, the UK, France, those who are particularly, and the US, those who are intervening, uh, clearly had the influence with the National Transitional Council to urge them to uh, uh, engage in a, uh, a, a negotiation. Um, uh, but it's very clear, and I, I think I have the evidence of that in the book, that the UK and France were not at all interested, uh, at least at the beginning, and although they gave lip service in the UN Security Council, the efforts of the UN Special Envoy, Mr. al -Khatib. Um, uh, They didn't get that real backing and they uh, were fairly contemptuous of the African Union, uh, with the scars of which are still felt uh, in the African Union uh, today. So if, if there had been a coordinated effort, could that have produced the managed transition? And, and of course, it's a further question of, would that have been better than the, the outcome because there would be other problems, other things people feared about, uh, about that. You know, ultimately we shall never know and, and Gaddafi was a huge obstacle, but I don't think one can say that the collective international community made the, the, the best coordinated efforts that it could towards that. And I wanted to, to dwell a bit on your role or as post-conflict planning advisor. Um, Obama, of course, afterwards blamed the Europeans for not having paid enough attention to the post-conflict phase, which I suppose was easy to do afterwards. Um, but there were other aspects which you in your book acknowledge in retrospect, uh, you might have underestimated, not only you obviously, but a lot of others, including uh, the, the tension that was there between Islamists and other political groups, and the, also the, the rivalries of other external actors in the region. I wonder whether you could say a little bit more about, about those, but also a little bit about post-conflict you know, conflict planning process. I mean, I, this is part in light of your long experience working with the UN. It's a, every time we have an operation, every time we have a new, I should of course have added, and I didn't do this, I do apologize that uh, Ian went on to serve on the high level panel for, for UN peace operations in 2015. And indeed some of your experience from Libya no doubt informed that as well. But what is the difficulty uh, of, of getting uh, uh, post-conflict right and all your experience from, from the Libya? Well, the first thing I want to say is uh, not only did Obama say that uh, not planning for the day after was the worst mistake of his presidency, but uh, an academic uh, witness told the House of Commons Foreign Affairs Committee that not a bit of thought was given to uh, the post-conflict uh, issues. And since my responsibility, as you said, was to think about that for the UN, I'm a little sensitive to, to that charge and do set out in the, in the book uh, what efforts were made by the UN, uh, by the UK and the US. I don't think you can't find France particularly pre pleasant, pre present in any post-conflict uh, thinking, but the, the, the were. Uh, efforts uh, by, by the UN, the US and the, and the UK in particular. Um, in retrospect, they don't look very realistic. Um, uh, I think uh, a lot of people underestimated, and I don't plead entirely guilty to this, because I think our own analysis in the, the UN was to say that the post-conflict mm -hmm. challenges were going to be very great, whereas there was too easy an assumption that uh, you know, Libya had a lot of money, so that wasn't going to be a problem. It had a lot of well-trained professionals, as indeed it did, you know, many of whom committed themselves to uh, return and, uh, and, and work for, for the new Libya. Um, but that underestimated, I think in particular, the, the institutional weakness of, of Libya. Um, mm. You know, the way I sort of summarize it, and I'm no historian of Libya, obviously, um, is that this was a country that had never had a period of institutional development. Uh, three provinces of the Ottoman Empire brought together under Italian colonialism that was extremely brutal and ultimately genocidal. 
uh, a Second World War battleground with other people's wars going to and fro, leaving it with virtually nothing uh, other than scrap metal in two bases um, at the end of the war, put together by the UN, that's an interesting bit of the history, um, uh, into a unified country with a monarchy, but ultimately a fairly weak monarchy that didn't achieve much in institutional development by 1969 when Gaddafi overthrew it. And then 40 years of a, uh, of a dictator who was you know, explicitly opposed to the development of the institutions of a, uh, of a modern democratic state. Now, to think that you can go from that to an easy transition is obviously, uh, obviously naive. Um, uh, but I think, I, I think the charge that those who intervened uh, didn't give sufficient attention and follow through uh, is justified. Um, uh, you know, there was a, again, one has to remember how many simultaneous issues were confronting policymakers uh, in the Arab uprisings and the tension very quickly turned to Syria and, uh, and, and elsewhere. Um, uh, but there was from the beginning a rather easy passing of the buck to the UN. Mm -hmm. It happened at the very first London conference uh, that uh, Cameron and Haig uh, convened and Secretary General Ban Ki-moon accepted that the UN would coordinate post-conflict and from then on um, it was regarded as a, as a UN responsibility, although what was really the central issue as became clearer and clearer, which was the security sector and the proliferation of armed groups who had been built up by the intervening countries and by their special forces operations on the ground, that was never an issue that, uh, that, that the UN was equipped to, uh, to, to, to resolve, uh, but it was a responsibility that I don't think the, uh, uh, the, the countries that intervened uh, uh, really accepted responsibility for. I mean, I think, again, in light of, you know, the benefit of hindsight, a, a, an argument to very quickly developed about whether part of the problem uh, was that the UN adopted a very light footprint and there was a big debate about the virtues of going light footprint to having heavy heavy missions and some suggested that there should have been a major stabilization and peacekeeping operation uh, in the aftermath of NATO's operation in place or rather instead of a so-called light footprint approach. Uh, and that didn't happen. And I wonder why, first of all, what do you think, what the war reasons why it didn't happen, whether that was all, all, any time a feasible option, this whole debate, light versus a heavy, heavy presence. It, it, it's hard to exaggerate the Libyan opposition mm -hmm. to having a major international military presence. They were grateful for NATO support and indeed special forces support on the ground during the uprising, but there was overwhelming opposition to boots on the ground later on. Um, again, you know, one must always remember how history weighs on situations. Iraq and Afghanistan were referred to a lot in the, uh, uh, in the, 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 the conversation. Um, in addition, uh, there was absolutely nobody who had any inclination to be willing to, to do it. Um, there was a point where in New York, the UN brought the uh, German representatives of the so-called P3, France, UK, US, the leading interveners, and said, you know, if you think there's going to need to be uh, a major military presence, you know, it's down to you because this isn't the sort of thing the UN can do in a, in a hurry. Uh, even limited contingency plans we drew up for military observers if there'd been agreement on a, on a ceasefire, were viewed very warily by uh, Libyan uh, interlocutors. So no Libyan openness to it, uh, no international interest or willingness to, to do it. Um, now, I have to confess that um, I didn't think that would have been in the interest of Libya at the time, and I don't think in retrospect it would be in the interest of Libya either, but that goes to how well or badly one thinks the international community does these things uh, and certainly imposing it on Libya uh, in, in 2011 
group would have uh, would have only added to problems on the on the ground. Um, you know, you're right. If you're implying that I'm a bit of a light footprint man myself, um, I tend to favour uh, smaller, smarter political interventions by the UN rather than major military deployments, although there are certainly contexts in which uh, major military deployments are, are necessary. Um, but I'm, I'm quite unconvinced that it would have been in Libya's interests to have had a, a, a substantial foreign military presence imposed on it in, uh, mm. in 2011. Maybe there were kind of lighter options that could have been looked at, uh, to which over time uh, the Libyans might have been more, more open, but um, uh, there wasn't much of a debate around that. Mm. I mean, that leads to, I think, a final question um, before I open up. Uh, and. I mean, you me I mentioned already your, you went on to serve on the high level panel for UN peace operations, and you sort of addressed this to some extent already. But, but what are the lessons looking back for the United Nations from, from this experience, from your study? You mentioned virtues of light footprint, big footprint. What, what would you sort of single out as perhaps the. <laughs> Well, the, the irony is that, uh, that I took into the high-level panel some of the lessons of the, of the Libya planning, which was seen as in the system as being, as being positive, uh, the, the way we brought different elements of the UN and the World Bank uh, together uh, in, a, in a planning exercise, the idea that we would get a mission on the ground fast, but would then... Uh, after we'd had an opportunity to engage with uh, Libyan actors, plan further stages, um, these influence some of the recommendations in the report of the high level panel on peace operations. Uh, the problem is it's not terribly popular to say, you know, look at the positive lessons of the planning of Unsville. Uh, I, you know, the, uh, it was a well-conducted operation, but the patient died, so to speak. Yeah. Um, but, uh, uh, if Anzmi was not seen as having been successful on the ground in, in, in practice. Uh, I, th I think the larger lessons, though, um, you know, go to what responsibilities can and can't be put on the UN, especially unless the UN has the strong support of key, key member states. Um, uh, and that goes particularly to, to the security sector, which I've mentioned. Um, you know, if, you, if you look at the uh, Foreign Office evidence to the House of Commons Select Committee, they're sort of, up to William Hague, they're sort of blaming the UN for not getting a grip on the security situation. Um, uh, the UN doesn't in general build armies in order to integrate uh, uh, a proliferation of armed groups into them. Um, that would have required um, very strong action by a number of key member states. I mean, in the end, the Libyans turned to the UN for a coordinating role because they were so fed up with the competition among the bilaterals to uh, uh, get closer to them as the kind of the key, the key players. Um, uh, so there, the kind of lesson is that the UN needs to be a little careful about being pushed in a position of appearing to take responsibility for something that uh, the backing of member states doesn't really enable them to fulfill. Okay, I'd like to I'd like to open up for for questions. Let, let me just add um, before I do that that there are met so many things in this book that are worth picking up on. We can't talk about everything. Let me just mention one or two things I think are particularly interesting. Uh, you touch on the role of, of special forces and the role played by special forces in this intervention. And it's not the only place where they have played an important role and a special role, often behind the scenes and in shadowy fashion. But I think it's an important and worthwhile looking at. And what you write about it is very interesting, based as it is large on open sources. Uh, but I think it's an interesting story. The other thing is what you just mentioned about security sector reform. I mean, the, I think your story shows, first of all, the centrality and absolute importance of addressing security sector reform issues, but also how very, very difficult they are to address. And that has to do partly with having a requisite sort of analytical understanding of a country's uh, political economy, if you like, uh, but also getting the right kind of you know, political buy-in and support from member states to, to tackle that properly. So I think on both both those areas you show you showed a very important and interesting light but let me open up for um for questions from the uh, from the audience starting with uh, my dear colleague uh, christine cheng uh, 
I promise you that's what I would ask with this question. Just to break the edge. So um, as I'm not calling them, I'm going to make um, on the distributed development. So I wanted to follow up on that point on the students around our materials. So looking forward, what is the best way to deal with the hundreds, if not thousands, of armed groups that are, you know, running rampant around the city? And I say this is especially one of my PhD students working on the uh, and this is one of the things that we very pleased to understand. Um, but you know, there's obviously no simple answer, and it's broad ranging. So could you actually offer a set of recommendations specified by actor? Um, well, I think it is worth saying, first of all, that, that the situation, I don't think there was any precedent for the situation that Libya faced in 2011. Uh, if there'd been a, you know, an, an outcome already in Syria, there, there might have been some parallels there. But um, uh, so there's no way you can look to for, you know, here's a case where this kind of proliferation of armed groups who've come out of a, 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 a rebellion and an uprising have been successfully, I mean, it's hard enough to find any successful examples of DDR, even in countries where there's just been, you know, one rebel group fighting a state army and integration into the state army afterwards. You know, the, the international system isn't very good at tackling that, and there aren't a lot of, uh, of positive lessons there. But insofar as anyone looked at Libya, the tendency was to, was to use the kind of the uh, the standard uh, vocabulary of DDR, disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration, security sector reform, although the situation that was being looked at was a, a, very, uh, a very different one. Um, there are, I think, people who have, I mean, who have continued to wrestle with this question in the case of Libya and have done some interesting work and have some. Uh, some proposals which are based not on thinking that the answer is, you know, create a national army and then, you know, and then you can integrate everybody into it, who advocate much more the kind of bottom up approach of working with uh, uh, armed groups and trying to bring them into a more disciplined framework and one of, of sort of local accountability. Um, and that's interesting to me because uh, in 2012, um, two things happened which are now looked at as, as unfavorably. One is that a lot of the armed groups were brought into something called the Supreme Security Committee, uh, which was under the Ministry of Interior and was supposed to be an auxiliary in policing functions. And the other was the creation of called Libya Shield, um, which was supposed to come under the authority of the chief of staff of the armed forces and be auxiliaries in, in, uh, um, in, in the responsibility of the, of the army. Um, and because of the way that eventually developed, that's seen as uh, something that in some way further entrenched armed groups rather than contributed to, to a bar board. At the time, uh, it looked to some of us as if that was at least bringing people under a degree of, of, uh, uh, of state authority um, uh, and might have been a step towards uh, uh, more proper integration. Well, that's not how it turned, that's not how it turned out. Um, but, uh, but I think one has, to, one has to start from where things are. All the, the later efforts, and I, you know, I can't claim to have followed these closely over the 10 years, the 10 years since, but all the later efforts have tend to focus on developing something in terms of the armed forces at the center. Um, and none of them have, uh, have, have so far succeeded. I have a job of looking at questions coming in from elsewhere. And I had a question here from Kevin Manson. Um, do you think from your UN experience that maybe any transferable lessons from past interventions or post conflict as part of future peace agreement between Russia and Ukraine? <laughs> uh, or is the possibility that can the end you enroll negligible to be irrelevant, so negligible as to be irrelevant? Well, I'm sure I'm not the best person to answer that question. Um, uh, 
I mean, the first thing to point out is that there was resistance to a UN monitoring role in Ukraine from Russia um, and uh, uh, an acceptance of a role from the OSCE, the Organization of Security and Cooperation in, in Europe. And the first thing to say about any UN, any peace operation is it has to have, I mean, unless we're talking about a peace enforcement, it has to have the consent of the parties. So. Uh, uh, where does one get to an agreement that not only defines uh, lines of control and responsibility of the parties, but is also accepted by the, the, the parties in terms of the deployment of, of, of an international actor? Um, you know, some people are already thinking about this and, and writing about it. Uh, Richard Gowan, um, the crisis group, United Nations uh, person who had written about it previously and is, is rethinking uh, what he's written already here. And as and when we head towards, hopefully, um, a, a, a negotiated outcome in the case of Ukraine, that will be a real issue. But there's certainly, uh, so far, absolutely no green light uh, from uh, uh, from from Russia to, to, to think about a, a UN role in that respect. Well, as a former Secretary General said, the great problem is coming to the United Nations when member states don't know what to do with them. And so there might still be a chance further down the line. I got to read. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. I'm very actually. Uh, it's really my extension on Russia because I remember Russia. Repeatedly saying that they were duped as the Western intentions. Yeah. Was there a point at which you could say, well, if the West had just delivered on uh, an immediate humanitarian objective, save the people's lives objective, and stopped, there might have been something more of a consensus at the initial point of view? Uh, Ian, can you just briefly summarize the question for because they asked there? So just the sure. essence of it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> The question is whether if the intervening countries had stuck more closely to the original UN Security Council mandate, uh, would that have been more likely to have been accepted by, by Russia? Um, and, 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 and right, right, and opened up other possibilities. First, I think it's, it's, I mean, the whole question of how Russia took its decision to abstain yeah. and, uh, is extremely interesting in itself. Um, yeah. uh, the, this happened during the presidency of Medvedev um, uh, and the foreign policy responsibility was with the president, not with the prime minister and Putin had stepped down as it were to be, to be prime minister. Um, and there are, I think, reasons to think that Medvedev was more open to a Western point of view about this, even before the uprisings began. Um, he took the decision to abstain on the resolution and even then defended it publicly against Putin when Putin very quickly criticized the NATO in intervention as a medieval crusade. So there's even public discussion, although Obama and some others think it's inconceivable that they took that decision to abstain without Putin's uh, agreement. So, so that's interesting. But there was also a later stage when, when Russia sought to play a constructive role, despite their criticism of the military action and brought their own envoy into, uh, into play, uh, and even sent the Russian chess champion to play chess with uh, Gaddafi and supposedly to uh, tell him that he was in the end game. Uh, <laughs> he, he was also tactfully said to have lost the game. <laughs> um, so uh, so the, 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 that, that's interesting. And, and it's also very significant because now in the Ukraine discussion, we're seeing references to, um, you know, to, ha to the extent to which the gradual souring of Putin was uh, fed by the sense of betrayal over Libya, of course, infected decision making over Syria. You know, there's even a story that he, you know, that the, the killing of Gaddafi had a, an, an impact um, on him. Um, so it's very, it's very relevant. Um, you know, I, this is not a moment when I want to quote Sergei Lavrov positively, um, but uh, there is a quote from him in the book in which he said, if, um, you know, if in future anyone wants our agreement to use force for an objective we all share, uh, 
they're going to have to say who's going to use that force, what the rules of engagement are, what its limits are. And, you know, it, it, it's hard not to agree <laughs> that the, uh, uh, I mean, there's no way that if members of the Security Council had known at the outset what was going to be done, what ended up being done in the course of the military action, not just by NATO, but by the bilateral special forces operation that Max has referred to, there wouldn't have been a majority in the Security Council for it, let alone uh, uh, a willingness on the part of Russia and China not to veto. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that, that one has to acknowledge, I think. Yes, go ahead. So when all necessary measures started in March, Saint Helena was very good. was so NATO was one of the two days delay between the date and the twenty third of August. I can't remember what the I was there. So I was in a conference call today with some lawyers and the officials from Libya. They asked me this question. So he said. When we are going to see all necessary measures to bring peace to Libya by United Nations. So, this is the real question nowadays. So, about the arm, arm to, to, to Libya or globally. So, when we look for countries like Qatar, UAE, Turkey, Egypt, France, Italy, all the arm, every arm group there are supported by one of these countries, unfortunately, and this is the fact. So, Libyans ask when United Nations go to show all failed measures or all necessary measures to bring safety and security to Libya. Again, about Ukraine. Uh, do you think that what's going on in Ukraine nowadays, especially about oil and gas, a lot of the news nowadays about uh, oil and gas from Algeria and Libya. So maybe that will bring peace. Well, it has to be very brief to summarize. <coughs> well, will the importance of Libya as an oil-producing country in the context of the world shortage following the Ukraine conflict, uh, will that in some way help in peace to Libya? No chance, I suspect is the answer to that. Um, um, but the, the, your earlier question, um, when will the United Nations bring all necessary measures to resolve uh, the situation that exists in Libya? Now, um, you know, the United Nations is made up of its member states um, and they, as you actually said in your own question, are deeply divided over Libya uh, and have been often very irresponsibly supporting different sides rather than trying to forge some international unity that through the UN or otherwise can contribute to a a path forward for, for Libya, and that, in my view, is the tragedy of what's happened with uh, with, with, with Libya. Um, but the extent to which, you know, the, the United Nations, I mean, the Secretary General, whoever is his special representative on the ground, can impose that as long as the member states are uh, pursuing their own interests is, is very, very limited. Um, uh, and the UN does make efforts, successive UN special envoys have made efforts to bring the different interna international actors closer together uh, in support of a peaceful path forward. Those are the efforts that are being made now by Stephanie Williams in terms of trying to produce a path that leads to uh, um, uh, an, an election. Um, but uh, Although we don't have the overt backing of sides that are fighting a civil war at the moment, uh, we still have uh, very clear differences of perspective amongst the, the international actors, and the UN itself can't resolve that. Yes. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> my name is Juma El Gamati. I'm from Libya. If you can allow me just to add a few anecdotes as I was partly involved on up to now. As I was in 2011, the um, National Transition Council uh, representative in the UK, coordinating with the British government. And then I got extensively involved when Ansman probably immediately after Ian handed over to Tarek Metri. Until today, I met all the involves and got involved with the dialogue that was uh, 
overseen by Ansmel under Lyon and, and, and so on, and a signatory to the political agreement in Sherat in 2015. Uh, so just a just few points, and perhaps uh, Ian can shed some light, and maybe I stand to be corrected as well. The first point is that there is, there is an international impression uh, that um, the Gaddafi regime was brought down by NATO. But the fact is, people forget that the uprising started on the 15th of February in Benghazi and quickly spread to all parts of Libya. And the first military attack, air attack, was actually on the 19th of March. So it was five weeks of purely Libyan and transit uprising, which meant that Gaddafi lost the whole of the East. He lost parts of the Western region, the Western mountain called Nafusa mountain close to the Tunisia Algeria border. He lost the center of Zawiya city, a major city 40 kilometers west of Tripoli. And he lost Nusrata, which is third or fourth largest city in Libya, 200 kilometers east of Tripoli. And he actually, he placed siege to Nusrata and bombarded for a few months and he could not reclaim it back. So we could say that those five weeks before NATO started the attacks, actually Gaddafi more or less lost control of Libya and his regime was beyond redemption. That is not to say that NATO did not embark on a major military campaign, which seemed to have targeted mainly the military infrastructure of Libya. I mean, that, that might raise a question mark, but that's an, another topic to, mm. to learn. That, that's the first point. The second point, talking about not preparing for the morning after or the, the day after. I remember in July, uh, be, talking to the foreign office here and speaking to the late Dr. Mahmoud Jibril, who was mm. running the executive office, equivalent to the prime minister of the National Transitional Council on the revolution side. I was speaking to him about a stabilization plan. Mm -hmm. And he said to me specifically, the Juma, we have been offered three plans, a stabilization plan by the UK, a stabilization plan by the US, but a stabilization plan by the UN, suggested by the UN. Mm -hmm. We are going with the stabilization plan suggested by the UN. And perhaps Ian can uh, uh, elaborate a bit more on that. So there was a stabilization plan. However, was it put to practice? Was it implemented immediately the, the day after the Gaddafi, Gaddafi uh, fell in Tripoli? The, I don't think it was. And, and here, yes, uh, textbook <clears throat> tell, textbooks tell us, and I'm, I'm an academic as well, that we should have done um, uh, DDR, SSR, uh, post-conflict reconstruction, uh, national reconciliation, and all these things. But it is true, what, what Ian has said, there are some intrinsic factors which are major obstacles. One of them is very weak capacity, we have to admit to that, because Gaddafi did not allow throughout 42 years for any political elites or a leadership to, to develop and evolve within Libya, and very weak institutions. Institutional building and state building was completely wiped out in 1969. Whatever the monarchy has developed, completely wiped out and brought back to zero. So there was no institution or state building whatsoever. So we're almost in a vacuum. Now that vacuum obviously was filled by militias and, and, and other forces. Now, the point here is there was a golden opportunity for the international community to help during 2012, 2014, 13, until mid 2014. Unfortunately, things took a very bad down downward turn in mid-2014 when we had the first major civil war. And ever since now, for the last eight years, we've just been moving from one civil war to another. Things have uh, got much, much worse. So I think that opportunity in the first two years was missed by the international community. And the reason why it was missed, I suggest, Ian, is that you, Ansmel, your role and all your the people who came after you as invoice, Ansmel is only as good as the major countries, especially the permanent five. Without those countries, Anzmel cannot do anything. And I think one of the major problems in over Libya is that the international players, we have about seven or eight countries who are regional and international players. They never had the cohesive aligned policy on Libya. Their narrow-minded interest meant that they were conflicting amongst each other. I can give you lots of examples, Italy and France, France and the UK, uh, Emirates and Qatar, Turkey and Egypt, and so on. And I think this is partly the problem which we are suffering until now. So uh, 
it's not easy. It's very easy to say the UN has failed. The international community did not have a plan. NATO is the one who brought down the regime and not the Libyans. But honestly, these are more of a cliches. When you look closely at it, it's far more complicated than that. I have one final little question to Ian. Now, he had an experience in Rwanda. Rwanda has a major, major civil war. You know, literally two tribes killing each other. Over a million people died. The question is, why is it that national reconciliation in Rwanda succeeded, whereas national reconciliation in Libya, which is far, probably far more easier, has been eluding us until now? That is, that is really a question that still, even me as a Libyan who's trying to contribute to achieving national reconciliation as a major step that we need along the road of stabilizing Libya, it, we find it very difficult. Is it because of internal, external factors? you know, using Libyans as proxies and feeding conflict? Is it because the international players are actually engaged in conflict containment rather than conflict resolution or what? That's 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 one thing. And one final anecdote. You mentioned about the light, uh, light footprint in Libya and not heavy policy. We remember very, I remember very well, we were very strongly saying the narrative, our Libyan narrative was, no boots on the ground. We don't want any direct administration. Why? Because we remember what happened in Iraq. Prema, he messed up the country, and I think he messed it up for good. And probably it will take decades and decades to, 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 for the Iraqis to reclaim Iraq. So we definitely did not want a replication of that whatsoever. Plus, our Libyan people are very proud and very nationalistic, and they remember the colonial days of it, the Italian colonialists and so on. So they are very sensitive to foreign forces being on their ground. So uh, I, I, think, I think that was the right thing actually to do, not to have much heavier international involvement in directly administering Libya immediately after the regime fell. Thank you. Okay. Well, thanks. So Mr. El Gamabi has emphasized a couple of things that I've already said and, and, and very much agree with um, just now that, uh, uh, that a heavy international military presence would, would not have been at all welcome to the Libyans. It would have been very unlikely to serve Libya well. I, I, would have turned half Libyans as jihadists. Well, exactly. I mean, I do. I, I think if in the unlikely event that an international military presence had been forced on Libya, it might have kind of united Libyan armed groups against the international actors, but that, that unity wouldn't have lasted very long. Um, uh, so I, I, I very much uh, agree with you on that. And you've also emphasized, as I did, the, uh, the weakness of the UN role as long as key member states uh, in the UN are deeply divided and uh, uh, in the way they're, they're involved. So we very much agree about both those things. Um, to take, I think, two of your main points. I mean, firstly, I very much, you were absolutely right to emphasize the extent to which Gaddafi had lost control of, of major places in Libya before the international military intervention began. That's absolutely true. And it's an important point because some of those who, who would ultimately oppose the intervention and say, oh, well, you know, if Gaddafi, if Gaddafi had taken Benghazi, nothing very terrible would have happened. Well, okay, so one argument is what would have happened in Benghazi itself, and uh, um, uh, I don't talk genocide, but I do think it would have been very, very nasty. Um, but that overlooks the fact, as you've emphasized, that major parts of the country, what then? I mean, uh, you, you, would, you would have had a civil war situation because there's no way that the rest of eastern Libya and the other places you, you refer to, Israel and so on, um, you know, I, I, I and, mean, you know, some people even talk as if there could have been a, a return to a nice, stable Libya under Gaddafi. I mean, that that gene was out of the bottle. So, um, uh, so I think you're, you're, you're quite right to emphasize that. On the post-conflict planning, um, I, I wouldn't myself uh, talk about it as three stabilization plans, one UN, <coughs> one US, one UK, although I do think the UN, the US and the UK were the players who did at least give some thought uh, and engaged with, as I should have said, engaged with Libyan plans too, because of the responsibilities established by, by the NTC. Um, but the NTC uh, plan, which was developed by Mahmoud Jifri, was informed by the UN suggestions more. That's, my, that's the point mm -hmm. you mentioned to me. 
Well, yeah, um, <laughs> but one of the problems, the people we worked with, uh, and you will know Dr. Ahmed Jahani, who was given a major responsibility by Dr. Jibril for VMTC's uh, post-conflict planning. None of those who we worked with, Dr. Jibril himself, Dr. Jahani, others, were ultimately part of the government that, uh, that, that, that the interim government that then steered Libya for uh, the first year. Um, and we can go into uh, doing the book, describe to some extent the, the politics that led to to that. So there was no, no real continuity uh, between the engagement we had as internationals at the planning stage with those who assumed responsibility in the first interim government. And we had to kind of rebuild, uh, uh, rebuild that. So that's a, a factor that I think needs to be taken into account. The other thing I would say about the sort of post-conflict planning, certainly so far as the Americans were concerned, perhaps to some extent as far as the UK was concerned, and again, it's, it's how previous situations weigh heavily. There was this great focus on the first hundred days and the fall of Tripoli. And it mustn't be like the fall of Baghdad because uh, you know, the chaos that followed the, the fall of Baghdad. So, so there was in many ways more emphasis on uh, the very short term uh, when Tripoli fell than there was on the longer term challenges that were going to need to be uh, to be faced, uh, particularly from the particularly from the Americans, and we can sort of understand uh, understand why, um, and that was a, a weakness in it. Um, but uh, yes, there wasn't a completely unified approach, and as I said, the uh, the relationships we built in the planning phase didn't carry forward into the work of the first interim government. I do agree with you that, that a critical period was after the first election, because when I left Libya after the election, my hope was that the elected General National Congress was going to provide the basis for a first government legitimized through election and that was able to play a stronger role. And uh, that somebody else needs to write a book about why things fell apart in 2012 to to 2014, not, not me. Some of us have ideas to be able to write a book. Maybe <laughs> lack of capacity is a measure. <laughs> Just to let the uh, online audience know, I haven't forgotten your questions, and I'll get back to you in a minute, but uh, you've been patient there. Yes, go ahead. Well, I'm very disappointed to see you and can't actually be working here, but um, I was just wondering, sort of, in quite a general sense, do you think? The concepts of the responsibility You know, I had a lot of very good friends who were dedicated to trying to make responsibility protect um, an effective tool. I have to tell you, I think that the language of responsibility protect has now become almost counterproductive in United Nations discussions. Uh, that doesn't mean that the impulse, I mean, the, 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 the need to think seriously about how, you know, how to prevent mass atrocities, uh, in what circumstances some form of external intervention is necessary and justified, how one should focus on rebuilding after those situations. I mean, all those elements need to be, you know, part of serious, serious focus of the international community. But the actual language of responsibility to protect has, has I'm afraid, <laughs> gone toxic um, uh, because of Libya. And, and I really advise people to pursue objectives that I share uh, in, in, in other language. Matt. Thank, Matt Preston, sorry. Go ahead. Thank, thank you very much, Matt. And thank you, Ian. Fantastic presentation. And I shouldn't say I confess I haven't brought up this. I brought up a the book with it and we'll get to sign it. Only one in the foreign. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say normally we'll go to the book launch in the aim of hoping to get enough saving in the reading book, but now I'm actually going to wait, go away and read it in detail. But I mean, you and I have talked about this and many other things over the years. I wonder if I may go, if I might ask you to step back from Libya and ask for your reflections on the project of international intervention. Um, because I mean, it strikes me, and I, I suspect you too, that we've been engaged in all sorts of military interventions over the last God knows how many years. Some of undoubted lawfulness, some of contested legality, but almost very few of them seem to have worked. Um, 
whether it's in Libya or Afghanistan or in Iraq or in Central African Republic or in Mali, some regional interventions, more than perhaps international, for example, in Somalia. Um, and it strikes me that the only ones that have consistently had a degree of success have been those which have been in support of a sitting government or one which has just been toppled. I'm thinking the Bosnias, the Sierra Leones. I mean, not uncontested successes, but we've had a series of interventions which may have been needed, but which seem to have been unable to set the frame for that cons consensus, that unity on political order thereafter. Where has that left you with the project of international intervention, whether lawful or unlawful, justified or unjustified? I'm not actually sure those factors have been the key ones. For Could I come in with one question? Sure, go ahead. Yeah. Not, I mean, bludging together Iraq and UN peacekeeping operations, I think is to my lot of different causations. But I do think if you look at, um, so one is, I'm not saying it's a similar question. If you look at Somalia, Democratic Republic of Congo, Sudan, etc., and then the mess in Syria and what happened in Iraq. Really, should we drop the conception of the UN peacekeeping interventions and instead think about mediation and humanitarian support? Because really, the UN can't do it. I mean, for the reasons you've outlined, and to kind of pretend that the capacity is there when it isn't. It's just to fool everyone and create mess in the name of the UN. I mean, there's plenty of mess in the name of Britain, the US, da da da, but that's their mess. Well, my, thing, my, my question is actually can anyone do anything other than create the mess? Well, maybe. My role as a member of the high level panel on peace operations was referred to, and the sort of the mantra of HIPPO, as it's called, is the primacy of politics. Um, and uh, all situations depend upon political outcomes, and they depend essentially on the national actors. Uh, and the question is, do you sometimes need external security provision, and can that help buy national actors the time to do what they need to do? Uh, does the or does the international presence actually complicate and stand in the way of the working out of solutions by the national actors, or can it genuinely support them and through mediation? That, uh, um, I mean, I'm definitely, you know, it happens that the three UN missions I've headed were all what the UN calls political missions, mm -hmm. as distinct from peacekeeping missions. In other words, they didn't have formed troops armed with a mandate to use, to use force. Um, and it's also interesting that uh, since our high level panel uh, was set up uh, and since Mali in 2014, there hasn't been another UN peacekeeping operation mandated. All the more recent uh, UN operations, and there aren't a lot of them, uh, Colombia and follow on in Haiti, uh, uh, are, are political missions. Uh, and I think there is an increasing tendency to be wary of large military deployments and to think that the UN role would better focus on the uh, uh, on, on the political political role. Um, so uh, I, I, you know, I wish as much discussion was devoted to that as to, I mean, there's still a huge industry around UN peacekeeping, you know, lots of meetings on the future of UN peacekeeping, when if one looks forward from 2014, it doesn't look as if there is much of a future for UN peacekeeping. Um, so maybe we should be focusing more on the political role of the of the UN and, and including through its political missions, but um, that leads to a lot of uh, organizational impediments in governments and in the UN as uh, the UN as well, unfortunately. Um, so I'm not quite ready to, you know, write off intervention per se, or even say there are no contexts in which some external military presence may be necessary. Uh, but there's no doubt that we see more situations where that adds to the problem than creates the solution. 
Uh, do you want to come in on this one or shall I just follow the, uh, the order? Okay, okay. The gentleman in the back and then you and then the uh, online audience. Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Okay, so I was just going to ask a question also because um, obviously if a lot of people in Europe have been watching quite recently. Libya has been like the situation has been shooting again. Um, there's more problems because the government's sort of doing sort of pilot. So I was just wondering, I mean, I was going to ask two sort of five closely related questions actually. Number one is what can the international community do now to try and move up peace? But number two, we look at these conflicts and we see that Libya keeps going into civil war after civil war after civil war. You can see the links, but it's the stages of fighting. Every time a civil war starts, at least most of the time, it's because one actor, typically external, has booked an internal actor in fighting, right? So quite recently, I'm fairly sure it was Egypt. I think Haftar had an agreement with one of the governments, then Egypt did not you know, if, if you agree to this, You'd be in a situation where you develop it, you have to, you have to put pressure on, I guess. The agreement broke down, the fighting might start again. So I'm wondering when you have a situation like this where external actors have played all of the parts, instead of focusing on talks like between the two France Berlin talks, the Cairo talks, instead of focusing on talks and getting these two governments to work together and trying to bring about a united government. Which, by the way, we have to try and do those talks have to go back. But instead of doing that, do you think it's worth maybe first taking a step back and actually trying to hold talks between the external actors, right? So between Turkey and Egypt, trying to get them to work out their differences. Because if they work out their differences, work out their cross conflicts, their states in Libya might lower. And therefore, once you start to see anger in that network, you can then try and get east between the uh, internal actors. Do you think that's a strategy that you could maybe think about following? But also what do you think the future is? Or what do you think the international community should do? Just for the online audience, the question is about the current situation and the tendency for external actors to fuel the conflict on the ground and turning our attention to them as much as to the internal actors. Ian, my commentary. I mean, successive UN envoys have spent a fair amount of time and attention to try to influence the external actors and bring them closer to being on the on the same page. Uh, you know, whether talking to them separately or sometimes together. Countries that haven't had such a kind of personal, you know, national interest in the situation, Germany most recently, and who therefore are more neutral in relation to the other external actors have devoted uh, quite a lot of effort to that. It's not that no efforts have been made in that, in that direction. Um, but your starting question, what should the external actors do? Well, of course, the answer is they should indeed try to work out a common position which flows not from their national interests but from the interests of Libya uh, and they should try to give Libyans too the space to work out their own solution um, but it's easy to say that uh, it's anything but what actually what actually happens uh, and um, uh, you know at, at the moment fortunately most of the external actors seem to be discouraging more actual fighting, uh, but conflicting roles haven't, uh, uh, haven't disappeared at all. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to condemn, uh, but quite hard to know how to, to address it. And it's another aspect of how the United Nations Security Council fails in what ought to be its role. I mean, it's actually quite reluctant even to call out uh, some of the external actors as frankly as their role should be uh, uh, exposed. Uh, and it certainly uh, isn't able to play a strong role in, in forcing greater responsibility <coughs> and, and, and unity among them. Let me just take two, two quick questions here before uh, they leave. Uh, <laughs> one of them I think you have touched on already and it comes back to the issue of justification. So I think when you answered about the R2P, that, that, that might have been your answer. The question is where do you think the development since, since 20, 2010, 2012, um, what, what is realistic to expect in the future? I mean, did the, although R2P wasn't instrumental in 
in front of the intervention, they did a lot of damage to the limited consensus that there was on it. What do you see? And perhaps the political missions might be the way in future. And the other question is whether you see any of these stabilization failures in Libya now being repeated in uh, Mali. Hmm. Um, I, I, you know, I, I very strongly believe in looking at all situations their own terms, and I'm usually fairly resistant to trying yeah. to sort of uh, interpret one situation in terms of another. And I didn't even tell Mr. El Gumati that I don't think looking at reconciliation in Rwanda is going to be very helpful in looking at reconciliation in, in Libya um, because of the radical differences in the situation. And I think that applies to to sort of to 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 Mali. Um, uh, Mali, one of Mali's problems is it does have not just one military presence, but it's had about three, if not more, um, uh, and that poses problems in its uh, in its in itself. Um, uh, in terms of what is the future, I mean, let's ask ourselves what would happen if there were another clear looming human rights come humanitarian tragedy. Uh, I mean, we have one, of course, in Ukraine, but but one that was... Uh, uh, we have one in Ethiopia, and the uh, woman wasn't in it. Exactly. Yeah. We, have, we have one in Ethiopia, we have one in Myanmar. Um, uh, um, <laughs> exactly, right. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, so, so, I mean, certainly part of the answer is that, that there is, the international community is both bitten by failure in other contexts and so divided that the prospect of agreement on a unified course of action is now very small. So, and I don't see either of those two things changing. Go ahead, sir. Yes. I was just wondering how, then, if you look at the situation in India and the kind of failures that are occurring, those extra failures. Um, that can, can be seen in various forms of intervention. Can we not then just agree that the UN as a, as a system requires a major restructuring if it's to continue working on this consensus basis, it's really not going to get anywhere. Um, and if it continues working with permanent members that don't reflect the wills and wishes of people across the globe, um, how much of a difference can it really make? Does the UN require a major restructuring project? Does it require it? Yes. Is there any chance that it will get it? No, um, I'm afraid. Uh, the, uh, uh, I mean, it's interesting that Ukraine has provoked one set of arguments about UN reform, especially from people who would like in some way to you know, get away from Russia having a veto uh, uh, as it supplied it in the case of Ukraine. That's not the major concern of most member states of the UN. The concern of most member states of, of, of the UN uh, has been the extent to which its decision making and the UN Security Council doesn't reflect current geopolitics in terms of the representation of, uh, of, of other regions, Africa, uh, um, and, and Africa, Asia, and uh, the Americas. Um, so there are almost two different conversations about UN reform going on. Um, uh, but the, the obstacles to UN reform are huge. Um, and in terms of formalities, anything that requires a change in the UN Charter requires agreement of two thirds of member states in the General Assembly and requires the current five permanent members in the end through their parliaments to, to endorse it. And that's a, obviously a very heroic uh, barrier to, to, to cross. Um, I, I think myself there's more sense in looking at you know, ways within the existing charter uh, that the UN could be more effective rather than thinking that there are going to be charter agreements. And, and the obstacle to changes in the composition of the Security Council isn't just the resistance of the current permanent members, it's also the inability of the rest of the, of the members to agree on, on what they want. They have conflicting interests as to where new representation would, would come for. 
you know, there are people who've been talking about a new San Francisco moment, and I've been looking back at the original San Francisco uh, conversations, but you know, that was preceded by very serious statesmanship by people in, in governments in an utterly different geopolitical context than if you open up Pandora's box in today's geopolitical context, you're not likely to get anything as good as the current UN Charter, I mean, I'm, I'm afraid. So, uh, so I think one has to be sufficiently pragmatic. I mean, yes, I'm strongly in favor of UN reform and indeed of reform of the UN Security Council. Um, but as long as we can't get there, let's look at what can be done within the existing charter and, and what coalitions of, of countries uh, you know, might achieve some reforms in that respect. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Kenny, uh, and uh, I'm from Norway, actually. And um, I was just uh, going to ask about um, public perception uh, when it comes to interventions, and especially if you say that we shouldn't completely give up on interventions and um, the RTP, but I mean, clearly something has to be um, in a different way. And I was wondering, just as kind of, I realized now as well, in terms of how maybe asking me what about all the times that we didn't intervene. And I think that's just my personal like, idea, perhaps, but that sometimes we do intervene and sometimes we don't. And I think this perception that it's quite interesting in a way, and that creates distrust. And I think that's one of the big challenges now, like you say, especially that you know, we shouldn't give up on it. And so really my question is how do you think that um, we can create more trust and can change the perception of intervention? Is it by changing rhetoric? Is it perhaps, I don't know why, Having more of a say universalized framework so it feels fairer without putting on a you know external structure in a sense. Um, so yeah, if you have any <clears throat> thoughts on that. Well, R2P and the International Commission on State Sovereignty that preceded it was an effort to do that. It was an effort to create a framework uh, that could be applied more consistently and objectively to, to, to different situations. But when push comes to shove, that's not the actual world. Uh, the, the world is a world of, uh, uh, of, of, of state interests at the particular time that a crisis, a crisis happens. Um, so, um, uh, so I, I don't think there's a, I, I don't think there's some new framework that can be created to get out of that situation. I, I, I just think that. Uh, those who have a, a, a more altruistic and less interest-driven approach to uh, to particular contexts, you know, have to fight to express that point of view uh, when when particular situations arise. I, I don't think there's a, an answer in some new formulation of, of intervention. Two, two more questions. Go ahead. A very quick uh, comment. There is a major paradox, isn't there, Ian? When you have countries who make up the UN, especially the permanent five, perhaps to a less extent China, who appoint UN missions and tell them to go into countries where there are conflicts and say to them, go and in, help in the conflict and bring peace to that country. Yet those same countries and others give us over the table, give us nice statements saying, we support UN, we support the, the effort, we support the missions, blah, blah, blah. And yet under the table, they are undermining those exact missions in those countries by actually fueling that, that same conflict, by actually taking on proxies within those countries and fueling that conflict. This is a major paradox. This is a dichotomy. This is, this, this is double standards. So how, how are we ever going to end these conflicts? How are we ever going to make the UN actually succeed or achieve anything we, as long as we have this paradox? This is, this is really, I think the major countries, especially the permanent five or permanent four, they are always pursuing their own narrow interest, national interest, rather than the interest of global peace or whatever the UN stands for. And I think this paradox, now Libya is paying a heavy price for that. Many other countries are paying a heavy price because the, the these civil wars and this erosion, this, this conflict that is now going on in Libya and it's getting worse and worse is actually mainly fueled by outside actors, regional and international actors and by major players in the world. So I think 
this, this paradox is going to be with us and it's not going to help at all. And in fact, if, if you have students here from your department, this will make a great research project perhaps for some of them. <laughs> um, did you want to take that as a comment or? Yeah. I think a comment, yes. yes. Sorry, yeah. I'm not sure it's a paradox, <laughs> it's a description of the world as it is. Yeah. Clear. Yeah. Yeah. Clear. Ian, do you think if we were to look back at the Cold War years, when every conflict in the world had the Soviets and the Americans on one side, the other, and lots of wars went on, you know, Vietnam spectacularly, but all over the place. As a big Ebola, but and the UN didn't believe it could stop it. I mean, hmm. maybe we should look at that period for what the UN can do when there's such conflict in the international system that maybe that period after the Collapse of the Soviet Union and that period of optimism about international institutions and multilateralism and development made us hope for something that slithered through our fingers and gone. And we need to reassess what the UN can do and see it as much more limited than we had in that before. Yes, I mean, there was a period between the end of the Cold War and 9 11 and the invasion of Iraq when you know, there was a, a lot of belief that international agreement was going to be more possible, but of course that was largely going to be international agreement on US terms. It was sort of, uh, that, that was the, 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 the belief at the, at the time. And uh, in retrospect, it's not so surprising that that's turned out to be a limited period rather than the end of history, as uh, somebody said. Um, so yes, I, I mean, I think you're right. I think one does have to I mean, it is a case for not giving up on the UN to remember that it did useful things during the Cold War uh, in a period when it was blocked in a lot of situations and even, uh, you know, even in the Cold War context, mm -hmm. even uh, Uthant in the context of Cuba, you know, was able to play a, to play a role. So, uh, so yes, we should we should look for that and uh, and, and, and not think that uh, we are. I mean, I think um, Antonio Guterres began talking about a new Cold War. I, I think a new Cold War is not a very good way to talk about it because uh, we're actually in a much more complicated multipolar world. Is a more accurate way of talking about it, and uh, uh, in, in particular, the, the role of China in future is posing questions that are very different from the sort of questions the Soviet Union posed in the in, in the Cold War. But um but but yes, let's let's look at what the UN can do and how it can be encouraged to be more effective in those contexts where it's not blocked by great power rivals. I think that's going to be our final question. I, yes. I'm a PhD candidate here at Queens. Um, I focus on uh, Libya from period 2003 to uh, Oh, good. Well, that's great. So you can so, tell me so, how it all went wrong. So, after. Uh, <laughs> so my question is, do you think, uh, do you, uh, I haven't really looked at it all the um, the role played by uh, Rahman Shanta in the, uh, the Libyan envoys from the United Nations, uh, do you think he was actually at least a feeling effect and, and so uh, and then put a case forward for intervention? And the actors like Bernard Lee and you know, the French side as well. I mean, surely without those two, you would have seen a very different reaction from the Chinese and Russians. Well, the question is referring to just to make sure everybody understands the roles that were played. I mean, a very dramatic moment at the UN was the defection, first of all, of the deputy permanent representative Ibrahim Debashi and virtually all the Libyan staff of the mission. And then eventually uh, Ambassador Shalgam, who was the permanent representative, a former foreign minister and close friend of Gaddafi. Uh, and there's no doubt that that made a huge impact on the diplomatic community uh, in, in New York. Um, and there's also the role of Bernard Henri Levy, who um, uh, I, um, uh, you know, I struggled through his book um, uh, uh, in which he accounts his role in, in Libya and uh, he's not modest about his uh, <laughs> uh, personal role, certainly. Uh, not just Libya. <laughs> he's behind the whole of the Arab so, uh, Indeed, indeed. So he is. Yeah, and uh, he recently visited Kiev, I think. Um, uh, but, uh, um, 
but I think one can go too far in attributing things to, to those personal roles of individuals. I, I think the forces, you know, they might have developed in a different way, but I, I, I wouldn't say that, um, uh, that, that, that either um, Sheldon's defection or Levy's role was necessarily critical. And one thing that I think is, is too much of a tendency in the UK and France is to is to minimize actual Arab agency in how the situation developed, um, uh, particularly the role of Qatar. But it's not only that. I mean, um, I, I quote in the book uh, and, uh, a, a very early statement by Arab intellectuals, a statement by a large number of Arab NGOs calling very early on for intervention, possibly including a no-fly zone, um, uh, you know, before Sarkozy was even out there sort of calling publicly for, yeah, for, Arab for League, that. the GCC, the yeah, Council. E exactly. The whole of them. And, and sometimes, I mean, Cameron in his book says, you know, William Hague persuaded the Arab League. Well, not at all. I mean, you know, Qatar was lobbying Washington, certainly, to my to my knowledge, sort of um, so, uh, you know, so, so one shouldn't, uh, I think, overemphasize the, uh, the, the Levy Sarkozy story in, 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 in this. Um, uh, there were a lot of forces building up, and I think they would have pointed towards intervention uh, despite those particular personal roles. Okay, on that note, um, it remains for me to thank the audience for coming, both Indeed. online and here. Uh, and of course, to thank Ian so much for producing the book, which I now hope you will all go and buy, but also for coming here and giving such a splendid uh, response to a lot of interesting questions. Um, so please join me, everyone, in giving a round of applause.